Coming at you from the library. The home library. <laughs> Do we even have to introduce ourselves? This is Jeannie. <laughs> Did you have to think about that? <laughs> <laughs> and this is Matt. Mm -hmm. um, I have a front desk. Oh. So occasionally I pull cards for Wi-Fi for the Instagram. It's true. Sometimes I pull cards just for myself. This is also true. And I you have this. a favorite deck lately. I have. It's the uh, the Druid the deck. Druid, yeah, been loving mm -hmm. it. So I pull cards today for myself because it's a full moon. It is. So I'm like, what do I need to know about the full moon, or what is what is some information that mm -hmm. needs to come my way? So lately, what I've been doing is I don't really stop. I shuffle the cards, but instead of stopping and pulling one, I usually just wait to see what pops out. Oh. So two popped out today. That's first one. Eight of Wands. Okay. First one. Mm -hmm. Do you want the second one before you tell me what that means? Oh, I'm telling you what this means? Well, you tell me what you think. You did not look up what the Eight of Wands means. I did. Uh oh. Well, I want to know what you think. Second one. Four of Pentacles. Huh. Both upright, not reversed. Okay. Yeah. And what are your thoughts? Uh, they seem pretty good. Well, it was like the the Pentacles one was like not like abundance, but well, Pentacles are always going to be about like work, money, business transactions. Yeah, yeah. And what was the Wands? The wands is like doing work, getting stuff done. What? Um. Yeah, it's like moving forward. I, I don't remember what the picture looks like on that deck, but it's usually a forward motion. Yeah, so... it uh, looks like a guy. Can you put it close to the sure. oh, that's right. camera? Kind of throwing a wand like a javelin. Oh, yeah. He's like throwing it like a javelin. It's yeah. like moving in the direction of um, goals. Ooh, okay. It can mean like rapid change. Ooh. All right. Rapid. Oh, what was your eyebrows doing? No, I mean, I mean that's my general reaction to rapid change. Yeah, it's usually like positive. So it's mm -hmm. right. It's positive. It's like um, focusing on focusing on what's on uh, your list of importance. Focusing on like priorities. Priorities probably okay. good, and then moving swiftly once you are able to focus. Ooh. Okay. Uh, in that direction. I like that. Mm -hmm. Felt good about it. Because I was thinking of also looking at things to do on the full moon. Since we are having a fire tonight. We are having a fire yeah. tonight. Um, What did you say about the pentacles? <laughs> uh, It had something to do with like maybe money, resources, or something like that. I didn't need to look at the book, which is over there, if you want me to go get it. Well, Biddy Tarot is like a really great place for beginners to start oh yeah biddy tarot is like a online tarot website it has basically everything and it talks about i mean like um it's just broken down in like a really digestible useful way oh, that's cool uh nice. so it's like um it can four of pentacles can be a little bit like feeling like scarcity or wanting um security around mm. resources uh i don't put that put that one up to the screen again so i can see it because you're on the other side of the is he bowing uh he's either locking or unlocking a chest it looks like he might be locking yeah yeah so sometimes it can be like you're so attached to the idea of money that you can't like move forward around something okay so things to think about i love it it's basically saying like we'll figure it out let's just redo the kitchen <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah i'm sure that's what it says definitely um you got anything front desky yeah or what were we doing edelweiss yeah that's our new favorite thing our new favorite thing um, 
I don't know if I have a necessarily like a new favorite thing, but I'm having this new invigoration around honey and okay. probably because I'm reading this book called the honey witch. Right. And then, um, you know, like we have lots of different kinds of honey in the house. Yeah. And I want. Do we have lots? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I don't know. I mean, we usually have the Trader Joe's kind that I use for coffee. And we have some in a different kind we get at Wegmans. Like or... the raw, yeah. organic, squeezy honey. Squeezy honey. And then we have chocolate honey, cacao honey. Oh, I didn't know that. We have medicinal honey. I think I have three different kinds of medicinal honey. Oh, wow. We have... Will I find these when we clean out the spice cupboard? Lavender honey. Oh. I think... Nice. And then springtime honey, which I almost am out of, which is mm. fine because here we are. Right. Um. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a favorite thing, but I'm like, I want to make honey cakes. Oh, also because we call each other honey cakes sometimes. Sure. And I'm like, honey cakes are a thing. They are. Are they featured in your book yet? They are featured in the book. Oh, yeah. I want to make them and I want to get little beehive shaped cake, cupcake pans. To I make. saw them in the Amazon cart. <laughs> Every now and then when I look for stuff on Amazon, sometimes I just browse. Mm. Usually for books, just in case if, like, the one I'm trying to find is something, if I can't find it in the library or a local bookstore, I have to fall go to Amazon. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe it's either the, the Kindle version is cheap or, you know, mm -hmm. it's available. But, yeah, every now and then it's like, oh, here's the cart. And there are five things in it. I didn't put any of them in there. So How'd they get in there? How they? I, don't, I know how they got in there. Yeah. Well, to be fair, everyone has our Amazon account. It's true. So sometimes the children put stuff in there. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes I get the email that says, your shipment's on the way. I'm like, what? And it's not going here. It's, it's not going, going here. Like yeah. SD Street or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's finally a nice day. It was crisp this morning. I love that. I know. We've been waiting for it. It's been raining all GD week. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Bless you. Thanks. That's not what we're here to talk about. Mm -mm. This episode is almost in direct response to our last episode. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, like, we feel like last episode we talked about TM mm -hmm. and the staff getting trained. Board members getting trained. Board members trained. getting trained, mm -hmm. right? And dipping in that practice which we all seem to be we actually all meditated yesterday we did at the end staff of staff meeting. meeting it was like it was cool life goal unlocked checked oh, yeah? off wow that's another one this year for you what was the other one teaching at a yoga festival oh yeah yeah teaching yeah. at a yoga festival that was fun too i know I didn't um know. i don't you know what we should do make a list yeah hmm. this is going to be maybe on our own podcast okay I think that's the next episode is, life goals yeah like Bucket Life list. goals, bucket lists, because there are two that you checked off this year that I didn't even know existed. Mm. So mm -hmm. maybe we should sit down and, <laughs> and share those. I think it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Well, I, I've i worked at a handful of places that have alluded to being heart-centered, soul-centered businesses. Mm-hmm. And I've also attended education programs that are those things. And it still felt like there was either it was non-existent or lacking in the amount of group meditations that take place. And there's enough research out there that shows how much more powerful a group meditating together is than an individual or a right. group manifesting together than an individual intending together, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So <clears throat> I've always had this vision, like I even, even at massage school, you know, like, well, we're going to have a staff meeting. We're all going to like meditate. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, it wasn't quite the vibe. It wasn't not the vibe. Right. But it also wasn't the vibe. Did we do that a lot at massage school? No. Okay. That's Good, what I'm saying. Zero memory of that. Yeah. And I'm happy that I'm not forgetting on a whole <laughs> thing we used to do. <laughs> no, it surprisingly wasn't a thing. Mm. Um, yeah. And then the last few years have been primarily us working remotely. So could we 
on Zoom meetings, mm. like take time and meditate together. Sure. Yeah. And there was an opportunity yesterday. We we're all in the same place. Yep. We're all at the studio. We're going to wrap up staff meeting with a 20 minute meditation together. Yeah. And I love that. I, I wish we could do that every Wednesday. I, I do too. Yeah. Um, I think what is true is we could do it every Wednesday after podcasting. Mm. And we could do it at the end of like these monthly, I'm going to call them film festivals. <laughs> Our monthly film festival. It's not, not at all what it is, is it? Filming festival. Um, yeah. So first Fridays are going, moving forward, going to be like where we film a bunch of content. Tomorrow's the 18th. Yeah. Well, that's because other stuff was happening yeah. um so first friday filming festival is a great time i like the alliteration i love alliteration yeah, so much good. uh yeah i mean that's a good time to meditate as well we'll yeah. all be there so i think it will just like create these little hmm. opportunities because it yeah. was it was nice it was nice and you know what not to say this is i don't want to sound like a jerk but we kind of like had to check in on our coworkers because with the meditation, our training, we got access to an app yeah. that has a timer. And, uh -huh. you know, when you are sitting with your eyes closed for a certain amount of time, you need some sort of cue to get out of. To open your eyes. Yes. Yeah. And that has to be a sound. Um, and they did not know that that was what it was for or part of i mean how for. telling how many of us have our phones on silent all the time right like just silent phones because you don't hear the chime at the right. end of the meditation you if your phone is on silent which insight timer is the same way like right. you have to have your volume up you have to have your sound on and then you have to put your phone on do not disturb otherwise yeah you're going to get 95 notifications in the middle of your meditation which makes no sense like yeah. that's kind of well, and also if you don't have any way any sound to bring you out of it you're constantly like checking the clock checking the clock yeah That's you can't way. really like go yeah. deep into <laughs> it because you're trying to right. be consciously aware or <laughs> not which i think one time mine i didn't have my volume up or something and i don't even know how much longer oh yeah i like, mean it was I... probably 35 40 minutes i was meditating jesus yeah Oh my gosh. It only wow. happened once because then I was like, oh, volume. <laughs> oh I'm like, why? I yeah, turned it, it on. To me, uh, I, re I realized, I saw the, I opened my eyes and looked at the time and it said three minutes left, but it looked weird, looked different. Mm -hmm. And it was not three minutes left in the actual meditation. It was three minutes of the, like the coming out. Come out slowly. Yeah. yeah, yeah from slowly the meditation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> This is how we learn. This is how we learn. This is how we learn. So, but it was a really good experience. I, we've done it in a group. I've done it in a group only one other time is then we went to that little like checking mm. thing downtown mm -hmm. in August, July, yep. August. Uh, I like that. I, it definitely feels different. I don't know exactly what it is or how to describe it, but it's definitely different doing it with the group than by yourself. Oh, totally. I mean, we have a bonus like because the two of us are meditating and we do it yep. together twice a day like yep. that's nice um and you know just knowing what i know about meditation in the context of like energetically in a space the more people you have yep. putting their energy towards the same thing it's just more useful this is why like the same thing is true about yoga you know mm. you can do your own yoga practice by yourself you know roll out your mat do whatever yep. And there's a different experience when you're in a group doing it oh, all totally. together. <clears throat> yeah, I, I um, really like it. So we always have each other to meditate with. I mean, the majority of the time. And then when I was on campus. Oh, yeah, you must have done it. We were meditating like every we didn't do like we would all meditate in our rooms before. Right. The first one. The yeah. The one, first I meditation of the day. Um, but we would meditate before dinner together. Oh, cool. Uh, every yeah. single day. So there is that. And then um, also it works online. So there were, yeah. 
the class that I took oh, yeah. over the summer at the end of that class, we would often right. meditate together too. So I, uh, I love it. I, I think I group it, yeah. meditation is, is a thing and to be able to do it at the end of like a work meeting and yeah. not be working at a place where people are like, you know, because when I was still teaching, we would do mindfulness meditation as a class every single day, okay. like often twice a day because there was this transition time after lunch to get them all back mm. <laughs> into the mode right. of thinking again. Um, and, and so I had this kind of aspiration given that my, the school that I was working for at the time paid for me to go to the mindful schools training. I'm like, Oh, you guys are all going to jump on board then. Like all the grownups, all the grownups are going to want to do this. No, they didn't. None of the grownups <laughs> wanted to ever do it. Like I'd be at a staff meeting. I'm like, let's just go into some mindfulness or one woman, the one that approved spending the professional development money on it. She was like, Jeannie, do you want to lead us in mindfulness? But everyone else was like, oh, yeah, Jeannie, let, lead us in mindfulness. You know, it was not ever received by the adults. Yeah, and the students and... just were like, all right, I guess this is 10 sure. less minutes that I'm going to have to do math. Right. It's not <laughs> It's not school activity. So right. sure, I'll, I'll buy in. Yeah. Um, I'll close my eyes for 10 that, minutes. It's such a bummer where, like, I have the same kind of memory, fair or not, where... I didn't do any or lead meditation or do it in a group with teachers, but I, it would not, it would have gone over the same way, mm. you know, it's like, Oh, I guess we'll do it. Or like, why are we doing this? Or we're we going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya together, uh -huh. which was the thing that all the boomer teachers would say when any topic got remotely close to like feelings, feelings. Yeah. Yeah. God forbid. God forbid. You we have those in a building. With if you're working with children. With They're thousand all people. Yeah. yeah. So Brutal. Anyway. Um, so yeah. So meditating in a group was great. I hope yeah. we continue to do it because I love it. Um but really, I mean this it's not unrelated to the topic of right. today, which is uh is the guru mm. kind of uh mm -hmm. the guru, not philosophy, but idea or the guru practice or the guru worship that yeah. is in definitely I mean, our field and many other fields too and i and honestly at this point i feel like it's a guru mindset mm. and i think like we i think we used to have very different standards of who we put on a pedestal. Right. Who do you mean by we? Just culturally, society. Okay. Yep. Um, and not only has that shifted, I think that this idea of guru mindset, where there's this person yeah, that we're going to just like pour our hopes, dreams, aspirations, saving, empowering, like that all of that gets just kind of like abdicated, handed over right. to this external being. And I think that we do it for gurus. Like if we're going to talk about our line of work. I, should we define guru? I don't think there's anyone listening that doesn't know what we mean by Yeah. Guru. I mean, we could like, so a spiritual teacher, a yeah. spiritual teacher slash leader. I mean, use the word guru, but I mean, it could be applied to anyone in any field. Right. That is usually this someone either originated the practice or philosophy or idea and then maybe it's passed down or maybe the starter of a lineage or then, just the continuance of a lineage yeah. like teacher to student to next student to next student. And what goes along with that is also like almost the worship, uh huh, the worship of the person, the worship of their ideas and what they say and the above inability. reproach. What's that? Often they are considered oh. above reproach. Yeah, you can't question anything. Um, yeah, and this, the the guru in that, you know, structure, I think, once upon a time was perhaps someone who had reached some kind of spiritual level or experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we're not going to get into whether I believe that that's a thing or not a thing, right? Like it, that, that doesn't even matter. It's like, there are, there are people that we think of historically who have this higher level of being. Mm. Um, and since many of them, I didn't meet in real life. I, uh, I, I can't attest to their <laughs> awakening. I can't to their, you know, witness. We don't know. Overcoming egoic tendencies, not be, by being seduced by things like greed and power, right? So I think that there's like the literal definition. And then there's also the way that we apply this to celebrities. Oh, yeah. Athletes. Yep. Politicians. Totally. You know, where it's like we feel so... I want to think that it comes from like, we feel so disempowered mm. and we feel so lacking in, in all of the ways that would make us perfect and able to ascend in life that it's much, <clears throat> it's not just easier, but it's also, um, it's comforting to just be like, this person knows it all. All I have yeah. to do is do what they say. I mean, in the most extreme example, it's you're just handing over your the responsibility of decision making yeah. or thinking and you say well yeah. all these decisions are made for me they've hand, they've told me how to think i don't need to worry about i don't need to worry about being wrong right i i am told all what is right well and that's why cults are so seductive right, right. because it's like uh, it's overwhelming to navigate developing your own moral compass to decide what your principles are to act on like not just <clears throat> ethical awareness but also questioning like what your beliefs are and where they came from mm -hmm. in order to come up with the next step for you in your life so it's it's just it's it's easier it oh, is so, yeah. so much easier yeah. you know and and then the things bleed into each other right so we're looking towards we're we're looking to celebrities to tell us how to vote mm. and we're looking towards gurus to tell us how to be in relationship like mm. you know in an intimate partnership like right. this is not their expertise <laughs> this is this this is you know like i i think like we've lost somewhere the respect for people who have like matured their way through a field yeah. And it doesn't mean that they're masters and it doesn't mean that they know everything. And it doesn't mean that they'll never make mistakes because this is what we're talking about human beings. It just means that they have spent the time, effort, energy, studying and maturing through their understanding and views to be an expert on something or to right. minimally be a guide and a teacher. Yeah. I, I mean, on a lesser example, I think of like the things I'm interested in, like books or music or playing music or any mm -hmm. other thing you know who do you want to learn from you want to learn from someone who is considered very either successful accomplished learned it in their field but it's in so much it's it's so dangerous to just say something like oh well this is the way this person did it and they're successful i will then therefore do exactly I'll, what they do did exactly what they did you know i will not question what they say about a certain topic you know, and it's it's tricky, especially because you usually find those people because you are, like you said, wanting. You know, if you're, even if you're not like wanting any sort of like heavier spiritual mm -hmm. guidance, you at least are in wanting of information or skill, right? Like if I'm going to follow like a yeah. an artist that draws for DC Comics and I want to learn to draw, I'm like, oh, what did they do? How are yeah. they doing it, right? And at the very least, like uh, they have something that I want. Or like mm -hmm. they, I, they have something they can offer, um, but yeah, there doesn't take a whole lot to teeter into that. Like, well, I will not question the way they do it. I will right. do it differently. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's important from, you know, a spiritual perspective, because so many people are just walking around with religious trauma, like, yeah. like pain shame um being cast out mm -hmm. not fitting in uh 
and then kind of being unmoored when it comes to spirituality, because it seems like there is this very huge difference, like this polarity between do everything that we say and follow this to the letter of the law, or people are like, you got to throw it all away because if right. you're not going to do it, you know, like there's no, right, it's right. either you're taking all of it or you are leaving it all. There's no, yeah, there's no, yeah. I mean, I've, we visited, Jessica and I visited a retreat space last spring. I'm not going to talk about where it was. Um, and it's, it's spiritually affiliated. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, the person giving us a tour was like, well, anybody, anybody can, can stay here. And, you know, we would love to have the opportunity to like do a talk in the middle. And I'm like, okay. Oh, the people that like run. Right. Because okay. they clearly have a lineage, a path that they're following. Gotcha. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, what would the, what would the interaction look like if a student was like, oh, I totally vibe with what you're saying. And I'm still, I still affiliate with this other spiritual lineage. And so I'm not going to change lineages. Mm. Um, and the woman was like, well, you can't, you can't just sample. And I was like, Ooh, we're not staying here. Right. <laughs> this is why we visit places. Like yeah. we're not staying here because that is not what I believe. You know, I think no. that human beings are all so individual. So in the way that I can't know someone's path to, uh, you know, getting married and having children, and if that's their choice or not their choice, and what parts of that they want to do, and in what structure they want to do it. You want to be married, not be married, um, single parent. Like, I don't have any, re like, I don't have any authority around there is a path to right. creating a family in mm -hmm. this world. I don't think there's a path to spirituality either. And so if you, you know, you resonate with certain parts of practices, you have that choice. Like that's, that's active choice in the moment. You can't sample. Yeah. You can't sample. First of all, I have a couple of thoughts. <laughs> Number one is, yeah, you can. And in fact, I would argue that that's the way to go. I mean, you should sample. Well, and I've always said like, it's for me, I don't, I, I never had religious trauma. Mm. So I feel like I have to lead with that all the time because I don't, there wasn't ever a moment where like dogmatic teachings imposed any kind of like shame and restriction on me okay. in my world growing up. Um, <clears throat> and so when I go to religious services, spiritual practices, like it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what the, the label is that's on that mm -hmm. because I'm just scanning for what is in alignment with connection and love. Like what, are, what is being said in this space that is asking us to be better to each other and ourselves. Yeah. That's all I'm listening for. Anything else is going to fly out. I mean, I might sit with it for a couple moments and be like, huh, wow, that probably was rough for some people to hear. Mm. No longer care goes out my, my ears. I think, you know, not so long, wasn't even a year ago, we went to a wedding that yeah. was very, what's the word? Orthodox? Yeah, it was a Catholic ceremony. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was a Roman Catholic wedding. Ca yeah, Catholic. Catholic. Um, <clears throat> and it happened to be on a feast day. Yeah. So they have to, like, yes, right. this is a wedding, and these two people are getting married, but because it's within the structure of this, this very specific day of the year where you say everybody in every church on the planet yeah. says this exact thing. And and tells this exact story. It was horrifying. Well, uh, yeah. Well, you know what's funny? It, <laughs> I can't even remember what it was because it was so horrifying. Yeah, there were a couple of bummers about the ceremony because it was at a a nice church, beautiful church, beautiful church. Um, and it was December eighth, like it was during Christmas time. Yes. So in our brains, the place is decked out for Christmas. Should have been. 
the trees or some evergreen, like the garland, right? Maybe nope. some lights up, maybe some wreaths. So we're, we're anticipating. I remember the church being <clears throat> like a, growing up. St. Greg's would decorate. The, there were a couple years. It was too early, though. Me, no, there were a couple years. Jeff and I were like volunteer. And I use quotes because I think we were volunteers. Forced yeah. children labor. Um, to help hang garland around the outside of the church like i remember twice we did it with some a parent that had kids in the school and mm -hmm. in the parish and literally that whole time it, we were doing it for hours we talked about tom clancy books like we were just bsing about that while we were hanging this stuff mm -hmm. and as far as like if you're a 40 something year old dude and you're like you're gonna have these two knuckleheads help you out with lights you could it could have, I mean, that's not a bad topic. I to... mean, fortunately, I imagine that you and Jeff as adolescents were also sort of 40 year old men. <laughs> well, Jeff was a much better reader, so he had read a lot more of the books. I, I think I only read like maybe one at this point. I definitely saw the movies, mm. so I could participate a little bit, but I just remember like we were talking about that <laughs> a lot. Um, but yeah, the, even in the inside, they had trees they would take out, and like even through the season of advent which is the basically count four weeks before christmas yeah trees are up there was decorations nothing there were no christmas decorations nothing so we were like oh what a bummer yeah because there were specific colors that are required for the feast of the madonna <laughs> it's almost as fun as watching you talk about sports okay it was Immaculate Conception, I think. Immaculate Conception is basically what I said. Uh, no. Um, I'm pretty sure that what Madonna is... had an album called Immaculate Collection. So there is it's the same. There's some kind of correlation here. What is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception? It is that Mary was conceived absent of sin. Yes. Yes. Without original sin. Nice. Um, ha ha, look oh, at but... me paying attention. But not only was the church not decorated. Was not. There was there the was story a, there of was Mary. The of that feast day. And, oh, it was like out of Genesis. It was so patriarchal. Definitely, it was so yeah, intense. It was. And we both, and my sister, and you, I was, we were like, oh. We're like, is anybody else hearing but, these uh, words? Like, is anyone actually listening? These are some odd choices, Jeff. <sighs> which is weird. And, you know, if it's funny. Like, if that was the first wedding. That like I had brought you to from old friends and uh -huh. family. And you were like, and maybe you hadn't met them very right. often. You would have thought, who are, what is going on? Right. right. Oh, but thankfully the priest during the homily mm -hmm. did say, these are readings that are done in every Catholic yes. church in the world on this feast day. And we were like, I think there was a collective, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> we were like, because anyone, I mean, I've known Jeff for over a decade at that yeah. point. I'm like, this isn't his vibe. At all. Like, this is not, it, this is not his vibe. So I can even go to ritual that is yeah. like that, that has right. those moments in it and use discernment that a number one, there is a historic, like context element tradition that is being invoked here yeah. that I don't have to understand. and it doesn't have to resonate with me um, that I can still look for the breadcrumbs that are aligning with be good people, take care of one another, cherish the time that we have together. Like these universal themes right. that are through almost any and every spiritual ritual practice across the world. <clears throat> it's all there. If you look for it. Um, and I think like it, what has happened in the West, <clears throat> uh, in the lines of like historic context, historical, why do I have a tickle? <clears throat> historical context is we have forgotten or we are not realizing that the majority of yoga as practiced by westerners was brought here in a big way 
in a big way and then successful kind of snowballing way in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And in the 1960s, there was this huge counterculture movement and there was a huge like psychedelic movements. Mm. And what had happened was a lot of the same people who were attracted to Eastern spirituality, in part thanks to the Beatles, were also attracted to that like alternative counterculture, um, you know, down with the man and the establishment and also you know, we have Timothy Leary and Aldous Huxley and experimenting with psychedelics. And when um, teachers from India came over, there was this very big concern that people were going to be doing these practices and imbibing in other Mm -hmm. spiritual stuff that's, that's being packaged as spiritual that, that they did not agree with that their culture wouldn't have agreed with, that it was not a part of the yoga world. And so there was a doubling down of like, this is the path. Do not diverge from this path. Don't do other types of yoga. Don't do other types of meditation. Don't do other things. Just come to my classes and listen to what I'm saying and do what I'm telling you to do. Um, And for better or worse, because that creates that, guru you know teacher level of like you can't question me you can't experiment don't think critically about this like just show up and do the things i'm telling you to do yeah um do we want to talk about briefly what brought this idea for this episode about i mean like we we recently had an experience where someone we know Mm -hmm. experienced this from a teacher Yeah, where, you know, and and this is, so I think I'm going to talk about it from more of like a, there is a changing of the guard right now happening very slowly within yoga and spiritual communities. And we are shifting out of guru mindset Mm -hmm. and we're shifting out of this sage on the stage putting people on a pedestal, like, like people on pedestals are falling left and right folks. Like we're seeing this in pop culture. We're seeing this in musicians. We're seeing this across the board. This is very like, what is it? Plutonian in nature. If Mm. we're thinking about what's going on uh, astrologically and there's this, there's an old guard of spiritual teachers in the West that have been around forever and teaching forever and have learned often firsthand from gurus who are no longer alive. Right. And they can't right now, or they haven't quite figured out how to move forward on the path. If that asks them to go against something their their teacher said to them 50 years ago. Yeah. You know? And so it's just, it's a, it's the old guard yeah. and, and there is a, there's, there will be a massive handing of the off of the baton. Right. It's always interesting to me when I see what we would call quote unquote old guard, mm-hmm. right? Just so staunchly try to resist um, new ideas or like questioning of the way things are done, mainly because like, what is going to happen when you're gone right not only like i didn't mean like necessarily dead off the planet but i mean you're going to actually teach until the day you are like maybe not so one day you will not be here you will not be doing this work and you know do you you know if you're you know do you think people aren't going to question like the not questioning only lasts for so long You know, maybe a generation, every generation that every new generation that comes up will will flat out reject 10 percent of whatever was taught at least and and fiercely question another 25 Mm -hmm. percent, you know, and the rest they'll be like, okay, maybe. But 
you got to assume there'll be some that they just disregard because of youth and some will disregard because they disagree with, with, with like the practice. Well, and it also completely disregards the inevitability of evolution mm. in regards to sustainability within a practice within a community. Like, you know, like the, the caricature of this, right. Is, um, this movie keeps coming up, so we're probably gonna have to watch it soon. Uh, in the movie Dogma. Nice. Oh, in the movie Dogma, when they're movie. rebranding the Catholic Church, <laughs> and it's like Buddy Christ, yeah. you know, with his like thumbs up, and it's like we're gonna, you know, we're rebranding um, to <laughs> rebranding to call in, you know, the next generation. Because right. if you don't call in the next generation, yeah. you're done. Yeah. You're done. And so like in any spiritual community and practice, there there has to be the intention around we need to keep up with the times. Yeah. We need to we need to make it clear that these practices, these traditions, these rituals, these things that we love, we need to be able to bring them into a contemporary space and a place of present moment awareness globally and individually. Um and, you know, I personally think, you know, because we're in this shifting of how we look at teachers or authority figures and putting kind of all of our eggs in some proverbial master's basket, you know, like now that we're, we're realizing that that, that doesn't work because human beings are not infallible, mm. that People make mistakes. People have egoic hooks. Greed is very present. Capitalism is very present. That if we want to move ahead, we have to stop looking at an individual to save us. Start looking within to what resonates for us, thinking critically about those things, and then surrounding ourselves with people who not are just who aren't just like like minded but our growth set minded with us. Right. Like, like we can all come together and know collectively that we don't know. Right. And we're here to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Buddhist spiritual leader. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh is one I pretend to be when I'm walking. It's the one that oh. said like, when you walk, okay. imagine that your feet are kissing the ground. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You know, Man, every podcast we've done 33, 34 for work. And actually, the last, the, the next one we're dropping for our own is 70. Woo! That's 100 podcasts. 100 podcasts. And I, you have told me shit that you have never told me in 10 years of knowing you, of being married to you. Like, if, I mean, you have mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm -hmm. I, I know that name. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you many of anything that he. Yeah wrote mm -hmm. believed taught but if you were to say to me we i have been complaining about your walking for <laughs> over a decade over a decade and if you said to me if you're like if if i'm trying to think of like usually it's just like oh my god can you just go any faster sometimes i feel like such a jerk because i feel like woody harrelson in true detective season mm -hmm. one when he's mm -hmm. in the car Matthew County is questioning the guy and he's just walking back and he's like, who walks that slow? <laughs> and I feel bad because, and then I'm like, and if I had made that connection, I probably would have given myself pause to say, you know what? This is how you like to walk and walking slow at times is great and necessary and essential. Mindful. Yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh. Well, I Thich Nhat Hanh walking. You Thich Nhat Hanh eating. Not because I want to. Well, it doesn't matter because until like two years ago, you didn't know why you were eating slowly. I mean, you just were. So I mean, we can just sort of, go with guess... the awareness Sure. I that also... everybody does a thing slow and right. we can be patient with each you're other. Right, you're right. I mean, I knew, I don't actually, I didn't know how small my esophagus was. If you think that 
Advil incident was the first time something I, I know that it wasn't the first right. time. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I never actually like got a, a someone who graduated from medical school to tell me your esophagus is like a straw. No. So Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um so Thich Nhat Han infamously is the person who said, you know, walk as though your feet are kissing yeah. the ground. Thich Nhat Hanh also said that the next Buddha is Sangha. Oh, like group. Yes. Community, oh, okay. spiritual community. That nice. that he would not be surprised if the next, you know, arrival of Buddha on mm. the planet is not an individual human being, but a community of people that live together in an intentional, mindful, loving, kindness centered way. Hmm. Um, and that's what I think too. You know, I, I am not waiting for a savior and I don't, know. huh? Yeah, no, I, yeah. yeah, I don't, I'm not waiting for a savior in a savior in any capacity. So when people are talking about the election, you know, when people are talking about, um, anyone kind of being the one to do the thing that's mm-hmm. going to, it's like, that's not how it actually works. You know, like we want to, we want to pinpoint figureheads. Like we want to be like MLK Jr. was the reason that we had the civil rights movement and made the ground, like covered the grounds that we did. Untrue. Right. This person was a part of it yeah. and a very important part and certainly not acting alone. And so like, we want so badly to be like, oh, you did it or you did it when we don't do anything in a vacuum. We don't do anything isolated. Like it takes groups of people coming together. It takes a a huge like mindset shift across the board and, and no different than how we started this conversation, which is kind of funny, which is like meditating in a group is more powerful. Yeah. You know? So what I think is true is that there there are still are teachers in many lineages that are are continuing to share what they have experienced and they know which is this is the guru and this yeah. is what he said yeah and it's, and it's usually a he it is definitely and it's unfortunate that there's so many teachers that are so willing to just say, well, this is the way it was done. Did you know that this this used to be passed on from father to son and that's it? Right. And like, therefore, yoga is the only way used to be taught by a teacher to a high born Brahmin young man. And like it's, just, it's so hard for me to think of anyone living in the 21st century right now or grew up in the 20th century to say to themselves. I feel comfortable telling a student I taught something that phrase. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel so icky about it. You know what yeah. I mean? That's so gross. It reminds me of a quote that I saw in a TikTok somewhere. And unfortunately, I think it's by Friedrich Nietzsche. Oh. <laughs> I know. But I mean, this is like why I'm like, a truth doesn't mind being questioned and a lie does not like being challenged. And it's like, all right, I don't, my opinion of you is, ah, I don't know, but. It's hard to argue with that phrase. Right. Yes. It's a pretty decent quote. It's right. a pretty decent quote. I mean, yeah. And 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 again, regardless of who's delivering the message, can you pass any message through that gate of like, does this resonate with me? Does this make sense to me? Like, like, don't sell yourself short on your ability to think critically right. when you're hearing new information when you're hearing repeated information mm. like cuz you're hearing it through a different lens i just think like that is that is a piece to self efficacy yeah. that we don't talk a lot about like and i'm not talking about the perennial uh devil's advocate like that's not what i'm saying yeah. like the the ability to be like hmm this person believes that this thing is true I don't know if I believe this thing is true yet. And I'm willing to sit with it and to to feel into it and to question parts of it to land in a place that I feel comfortable with. And I think that that needs to be true more across the board. Like whatever trainings you take, mm. 
whatever path your spirituality flows down, um, it's still highly likely you will encounter a teacher that is entrenched in the ways of the old guard Mm -hmm. and that there is this abdication of responsibility and sovereignty to a guru and the guru knows everything. And if you just apply what they said 80 years ago to this situation that didn't even exist 80 years ago, (laughs) you'll figure out what the truth is, right? Like to be able to have that moment of like, Hmm. And I think this is particularly important anytime spiritual text is brought into the conversation because that might very well be what it says in the Upanishads Mm -hmm. that you read that was translated at least twice Yeah, because most of these books, these ancient texts that are not written in English went through a couple of translations. You know, I, I keep bringing up in class. Uh, what is it? So, for a long time, well, you probably know more about this than I do, but for a long time, the majority of books were translated like from Latin into German, right? From Sanskrit into. Uh, I mean, the first person to do that with the Bible was like Martin Luther. Uh, you know, Latin was the language of the clergy. Yep. Intentionally, mm-hmm. because it was never it was never the. Uh, the vernacular right it wasn't written <laughs> we, of, we can't just let anybody read right. what god has to say and read it like we that's i mean they just justified their job right yep. it's like well you need me to translate speak and teach this to you and he was the first one to say to translate it i think into the common language and that happened like post renaissance mm-hmm. 15th, uh, 15th 16th century yep um but yeah until then it was gate kept totally i mean even I mean, even with the translations, not everyone could read, you know what right. I mean? So it was still severely gate kept from everybody. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at least, you know, some people that could read were able to more so than just like the clergy that could speak Latin. And then you're relying on the ability for a translation to appropriately translate colloquialisms, vernacular, right uh metaphors geez have you ever try to translate a metaphor good god this is why humor is so hard to translate into right. other languages right like and and so like we're like well this is what it said in the vedas i'm like oh do you read sanskrit <laughs> right did you read that yeah. do you, do you also know the context within which that language was used and i saw this on tiktok probably maybe instagram and it was like 400 years from now, people are not going to know the difference between a pocket dial, a butt dial, and a booty call. (laughs) A butt dial and a booty call are the same thing translated for 400 years from now, right? So it's like, you cannot tell me that you know with beyond a shadow of a doubt because it was written in a text. And we're not going to get into the fact that so many practices, so many spiritual traditions were first passed orally and if you think that there was not interpretation and and um you know context given in a different way based on who the teacher was and who they were teaching i mean jesus christ any seventh grade social studies class will play telephone for this good lord example good lord Yeah. yeah so you know we just have to have that that level of discernment understanding the context within which these teachings have arrived to us today, what resonates with us and what doesn't resonate. And, and for me, it always comes down to personal experience. Like Mm. even when I know someone loves someone, trust someone and they teach me something, I'm like, that's great. I'm so glad that worked for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about it like, I mean, it's a, it's a silly comparison, but like diet fads, you know, oh, like, yeah. oh, cabbage soup for three weeks and you lost 20 pounds. That worked for you. Like, that's great. I have no idea if that would work for me or be healthy for my body. Like, so we just want to keep passing things through that yeah. lens and remembering that human beings are human beings. Yeah. And it still, it always surprises me that this comes up as often as it does in many different fields 
when we in this country pride ourselves on being such fierce individuals, mm. which like, are you just showing your ass? Like, are you not like, you're just projecting then? Like, mm. I, I don't, I think you wish you were, but then you're looking around to see if everyone agrees with you. When, if you were really that fierce of an individual, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't care. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we will not leave this topic here for all time. I'm sure we'll return to it. Often. Future podcasts. For often. Various reasons. Regularly checking in, making sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Use discernment. Yes. Good stuff, honey. As always. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> what are we here to do? Uh, for the Wi-Fi pod and for the eight of wands and the four pentacles this is matt this is genie everyone